One, two, three. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Latin American Webinars in Physics. I'm Nicolas Bernal from Universidad, no, New York University in Abu Dhabi. So I will be your host today. So today we have uh, Young Shu. So Young did his PhD in the University of Bonn in Germany. And he recently started uh, his postdoc in, um, in mines. So Young will talk about gravitational waves producing during reheating by Bram Stragon process of the graviton. So we are super happy to have you here, Young. So if you want, you could start um, sharing your screen. Okay, let me try. So can you see the screen? Yes. Uh, okay. Mm. Yeah, so thanks a lot for uh, the introduction. Yeah, I, I also want to mention that though I did my PhD in Bonn, but uh, Nicholas is uh, the co-supervisor co of my thesis. Yeah, so it's a great pleasure to speak here. And uh, I, I like the philosophy of law physics a lot, and I'm a follower of it. So it's really a pleasure to uh, to talk something about my research here. So today I'm going to discuss um, a recent project uh, in collaboration with uh, Basbendu, uh, Nicholas, and Oscar regarding gravitational wave from graviton branch down during inflationary heating. So. So the purpose of this talk will be twofold. First, I will show that there is an unavoidable source of gravitation wave via branch tunnel during inflation reheating. And secondly, I will show that the branch tunnel gravitation wave can be used to say something about the physics of reheating. So this is the two purpose of this talk. And the scope of this talk will be the following. So, in the textbook, there are many, many sources of gravitational wave. For example, uh, during inflation, you have uh, inflaton fluctuation, and where the Einstein equation, you have the fluctuation of the metric. So this is one source of gravitational wave. Or during preheating, you have some uh, inhomogeneity of modes being produced. This can also source gravitational wave. Uh, or you have phase transition, you have the collision of bubbles, which can also source a gravitational wave. But today in this talk, I will focus on the direct graviton emission as a source of gravitational wave. So the setup will be uh, the following. It's very simple. First of all, we consider a perturbation of the metric along the flat one. And this is uh, the excitation of the metric, which will correspond to the spin two graviton field. So now, if we plug in this perturbation or expansion back to the action, we get the effective coupling between the graviton and the energy moment energy momentum tensor. So as you can see from this uh, uh, coupling, you see the emission rate of the graviton suffers a uh, suppression by one over m Planck square. So in order to get efficient uh, graviton emission, we need a very large energy momentum tensor. And I want to mention that inflationary preheat, uh, inflationary heating is a natural source to give rise to such large energy momentum tensor. So this is the scope of the talk. And now I want to briefly give some outline for this talk. First, I want to briefly mention cosmic inflation and reheating. Then I will discuss the graviton branch tunnel as a source of gravitational wave during reheating. Then I will discuss the contribution of the graviton to the delta EFF. Then I will discuss the gravitational wave spectrum. And finally, I will summarize. So yeah, so inflation corresponds to the exponential expansion of the uh, space in the very early universe. And the dynamics is usually driven by some uh, scalar field slowly rolls down some flat potential. So due to inflation, the universe can be driven from very tiny scale to a big scale. And this 
this explains why we have a big universe. Also, because of the quantum nature of the scalar field, there will be some fluctuation when the field are moving along the potential. So this fluctuation will source the inhomogeneity, which we saw in the CMB map. This is also the seed for the structure formation. So inflation solves many problems. And so well, after, after the inflaton moves far from, from the flat part, the inflaton will start to oscillate. And at the same time, it will transfer energy to some radiation so that we will have a thermal universe. So the energy transfer stage is usually uh, called uh, reheating. And uh, it can be, ha uh, can be perceived via the inflaton decay. For example, the inflaton can decay to some uh, bosonic particle like the stand model Higgs or fermionic particle. So in general, the reheating can be very, very involved. For example, you, you could have some long perturbed preheating. Let's, for example, uh, look at the bosonic channel, the very fine, this particle. And this is the equation of motion for the bosonic particle in momentum space. So here the K is a momentum. You see, due to the trilinear coupling, the mu phi by sphere, once the inflaton oscillate uh, move on the left part of the minimum, so this, this part is negative. So if you move this part to uh, the right-hand side of the equation, you get the exponential production of the uh, particle. So this, this kind of tectonic uh, instability tended to make preheating very, very efficient. But in our setup, the doctor particle or boson particle phi, the small phi, will be the Higgs, which features a sizable self-coupling. So once you produce a lot of Higgs, there will be a inversion, the variance term, once you plug in the Hutch approximation. So you say there will be a effective positive mass. This effective positive mass will count react on the negative mass, making preheating less efficient. So this is uh, uh, for a bosonic case. And for the fermionic case, due to the poly blocking, preheating in, geno in general is not efficient. So uh, the remark will be the preheating is not efficient in our setup. So in the following, I will mainly focus on perturbative preheating. Then we can write down the decay rate, for example, for a, a bosonic channel. Or, or for the fermionic channel. Once you have the decay rate, you can further estimate uh, the reheating temperature here. So I have mentioned the two setup. One is uh, effective coupling between graviton and the energy momentum tensor. The other one is a perturbative reheating. So once you have a two, this two, we will have direct uh, graviton em emission during perturbative reheating. So these are the four possible diagrams. For example, uh, here the phi is the initial inflaton field, and the F is a doctor particle, and the uh, H nu nu is a graviton field. So there will be four possible channels uh, because uh, the graviton can be associated in the initial state or the final state here and here, or on the vertex. So the main task, one of the main tasks in this talk is to estimate the emission rate of the graviton. Or in other words, we have to calculate the matrix element. But before we do that, I would like to briefly mention the polarization of graviton. Because the graviton is massless. So there are two physical states or two polarization states. And the graviton polarization tensor satisfies a set of uh, conditions. First, it has to be symmetric. Then it has to be transverse, then traceless, and autonomous. And you can choose a frame where the um, graviton moves. For example, here, I just chose um, graviton move along the x direction. So once you have a momenta, you can try to construct the 
polarization tensor. So here are the two possibility. It's easy to check that this uh, polarization tensor satisfies these conditions. And I also would like to mention that um, if you choose different uh, uh, frame where the graviton moves, you will end up with different polarization tensor, but in the end, it doesn't matter. So here, uh, I just choose it uh, for convenience. So here I consider uh, inflaton decay to a scalar, scalar final, final state. And this is the four Feynman diagrams. And uh, M1 correspond to the matrix element for the first diagram and so on and so forth. This is M2, M3, and M4. And I would like to first mention M4. You see, this is a, just the trace of the polarization tensor. As I mentioned before, the graviton is traceless. So this, this matrix element has to vanish. On the other hand, uh, you see, the, the graviton can associate in the initial state where the uh, momentum is R or in the final state where with momentum P or here. You see the result is very, very sym symmetric. If it is associated in the initial state with momentum R, you have R nu nu times the graviton polarization tensor. If it associated with P, you have P nu P nu times the polarization tensor and so on and so forth. So a lot of important point, another important point is that because here the inflaton decay at rest, which means that the only the first component is not zero. So if you if we go back to uh, the polarization tensor of the graviton, the only non-vanishing component is the last two here and here. So you say the, the M1 vanish. So in the end, we will only have two matrix elements, M2 and M3. And this uh, sim simplify our calculation a lot. So we, we, we now just need to calculate the square and the cross. Here, I, I want to show you uh, how the emission uh, rate looks like. So here, uh, E omega corresponds to the graviton energy and I define a new variable for the X and which is scaled by the inflaton mass. So the, the result looks very, very simple and instructive. First, you have this phase, phase space factor, the six, 64 pi cube, and this is a coupling square. So the new corresponds to the trilinear coupling between the inflaton and the doctor particle. And you also have one over M Planck square due to the gravitational coupling. So you see, if x goes to half, then this differential rate goes to zero. So physically, the, uh, the reason is that because the graviton could at most carry half of the inflaton energy. So once you, you cannot go beyond that, this is the reason why you, you have a cutoff. On the other hand, there will be a divergence when x goes to zero. This is actually very, very similar to the uh, IR divergence in the QED case. And if you want to resolve this divergence, you would have to consider the vertex and the self energy diagram. So this is a differential rate for the scalar case. And uh, now I briefly uh, show the for fermion and the vector case. The result is very, very similar. You have a coupling square, and you have, a, you have a feature that when X goes to zero, the differential rate goes to zero. You have a feature that when X goes to zero, there will be a divergence. And the only difference comes from that for fermion case, you have to do the uh, spin sum. And for a vector case, you have to do the polarization sum. This is the main reason why we have different terms compared to the most simple scalar case. So yeah, so we, ha we have now have the differential rate and now we are ready to study how the whole system evolved. By the whole system, I mean, we have the inflaton, we have some radiation and we have gravitational wave. So this is uh, uh, the evolution will be governed by a set of differential equation. 
So here the gamma zero correspond to the two body decay without graviton and gamma one correspond to uh, the three body decay with graviton. If I set gamma one to be zero, you have the usual uh, Boltzmann equation. And now if I uh, insert gamma one, as we, for, we are focusing on here, you see uh, we have new terms. Now I will explain uh, why the new term looks like this. For example, let's first look at the evolution for a gravitation wave energy density. Um, here, I, here the E omega divided by M uh, correspond to the fraction of the energy goes to, from inflaton to a uh, gravitation wave. Because as I mentioned before, the graviton energy can go from zero to half of the inflaton mass. So you have to sum over all the graviton energy. This is the reason why you have, uh, why you have a integral here. And the rest part of the energy goes to radiation. And similar, we have to sum over all the graviton energy. And this is the reason you, you also have an integral here. So with this three equation, uh, we can get the solution for a gravitation wave. And the solution be, uh, look like this. It's also very instructive. And first, this first term uh, looks like the differential branching ratio. And the second piece correspond to the energy fraction in each decay. So if you integrate uh, over the solution, you will get, uh, get the whole energy stored in the gravitational wave. So, yeah. And gravitational wave effectively also behave like uh, dark radiation. So it will contribute to the uh, effective number, number of species of neutrinos or the so-called delta EFF. So in this plot, I show you the delta EFF versus the mass of the inflaton. And the different line correspond to, for example, the black line correspond to the vector, the inflaton decay to vector, and the blue line correspond to inflaton decay to fermion, and the red line correspond to inflaton decay to scalar. Uh, together with a, a actual graviton. So you say, unless you have very, very massive graviton, um, it is almost uh, not constrainable even by the future CMB experiment. And also I would, I would like to mention the topology of this three line. The, the main reason why the black line is on the top because for vector, we have three degree uh, polarization uh, three three degree freedoms, and for for fermion we have two spin, and scalars we have we, we only have one degree freedom. So this is the reason why uh, the black is on top of blue, and the blue is on top of scalar. So now we can move to the uh, spectrum for a gravitational wave, and. We can, uh, th this is just a normal definition of the gravitational wave uh, amplitude, and it's proportional to the differential rate of the graviton emission. So we can use the solution uh, from the Boltzmann equation. We can estimate what is the uh, gravitational wave amplitude looks like. It is very similar to the other gravitational wave source during reheating. The amplitude will be proportional to the reheating temperature, then proportional to also the frequency of the gravitation wave. And the gravitation wave frequency uh, is related with the graviton energy via the Einstein re uh, relation, where the energy equal to the Planck constant times the frequency. Here, uh, I set h bar to be one. This is the reason I have a two pi. And the uh, graviton after uh, production will redshift this is the reason why, why I have some skill factor. And you can treat this skill factor with respect to temperature by using the fact that uh, entropy is conserved. So we also mentioned before, the graviton energy could only be half of the inflator mass. So this also means that there will be a upper bound for the, graviton, um, uh, for the gravitation wave uh, frequency. You say if you have Planck, uh, if you have Planck scale inflaton mass, uh, the frequency can be very high. So now I show you how the spectrum looks like. 
and here I the y axis corresponds to the dimensionless uh, stream parameter, which is defined here. And in this plot, I I show you two. Uh, I choose two benchmark uh, parameter. Uh, the first one. I consider inflaton mass around 0.1 times the uh, Planck mass, and reheating temperature corresponds to the current upper bound um, from the CMB. And, and for the second one, I consider smaller mass. Also, I uh, the the black line corresponds to vector, and the blue line corresponds to fermion, and red red line corresponds to scalar. You see, if I decrease the uh, the inflator mass and reheating temperature, the signal gets a decrease of as expected. So from this figure, I also show several uh, several experimental bonds in, in the future, the DCGO or the cavity experiment. You say in order to uh, for a signal to be detectable, we need a very, very large inflator mass and reheating temperature. And it is not clear how to construct a realistic inflation model uh, giving rise to this kind of uh, parameter, but it's not uh, impossible. So, so far we have only considered a inflaton mass oscillate around a quadratic potential. So what if uh, the inflaton uh, potential is deeper than quadratic? For example, we can consider inflaton oscillate around potential with uh, phi power n with n larger than two. And this kind of setup is very, very well motivated in, for example, the alpha track T or E model. So once we consider n larger than two, you say the inflaton mass or namely the second derivative of the potential becomes field dependent. Now, if you look at, uh, if we recall the definition of the two uh, decay rate, in the Bosani case, it is uh, one over m uh, m phi, and for a Fermion case, it's proportional to m phi. So due to the field dependent mass of the uh, inflaton, you see, in the Bosani case, the decay rate can be suppressed because we transfer the energy from inflaton to radiation via the decay. If the decay rate is suppressed, which means that the Though R or the radiation energy can also be suppressed. If you recall the definition of the gravitational wave energy density, it is inverse proportional to though R. So if though R is smaller, the spectrum can be boosted. So physically, um, this means that if you have less entropy dilution, you can further have larger amplitude for a gravitational wave. So here I show the evolution for the uh, energy density for radiation and uh, uh, inflaton energy density. I consider, for example, in the first panel, I consider n equal to two, and uh, now I increase n. You see, now let's first look at n equal to two. So we are mainly focused on the black line, namely the radiation. So it's here. Now you, you say if I increase the n, in the Bosani case, the, the black line, the slope become uh, slower, become smaller compared to n equal two case. And for a Fermiani case, the slope become even larger. So this means that in the Bosani case, uh, the radiation can be suppressed as I explained in the previous slide. So now we are ready to study the implication of the evolution of a radiation to the gravitational wave. So here is uh, the result. Here I consider uh, inflaton oscillate, for example, uh, around a quadratic and uh, with n larger than two, for example, n equal to four and n equal to six. Here I, you say if I increase n, the signal can be significantly boosted due to the fact I, I mentioned before. And in the in the boson in the fermion case, we don't observe any um, a boosted uh, feature. So a lot of important information I would like to mention that in this plot I consider very very small parameter. Like for example, I consider inflaton mass around 10 to 13 GeV. 
And this kind of parameter can be realized in many inflation model. So now uh, we may ask uh, what will happen if the future de detector frequency res resonant cavity do not see any signal. If it does not see any signal, which means that those bosonic uh, reheating scenario for gram N to six are ruled out. So in this sense, uh, it seems that the future gravitational wave experiment could potentially help to prove or pinpoint the dynamics of reheating. For example, it can tell us the shape of the infinite potential when it oscillates, also the type is bosonic or fermionic. So I now are ready to summarize. So in this talk, I have shown that due to the unavoidable uh, coupling between the metric uh, and energy mo momentum tensor, the graviton can be produced via branch tunnel. And uh, it will further, this graviton further give rise to a gravitational, cosmological gravitational spectrum. And the spectrum depends on first the the shape of the infinite potential during uh, reheating. Also, it depends on the, the type of the infinite to matter coupling. So we, we have also seen that for a quadratic potential, we need a very large uh, infinite mass and the reheating temperature in order to make the signal detectable. However, for potentials deeper than quadratic, the gravitational wave in the bosonic case can be significantly boosted. And uh, even, even though it can be detected even, even with very small uh, inflate on uh, mass and the reheating temperature. So I think this is something very important. So the conclusion will be uh, reheating uh, urine is a, very, is a black box, but our study uh, via graviton branch talon hopefully offers a new venue to explore the physics of reheating. So I think this is all I want to share today. Now I think we can discuss. Yeah, thanks a lot for attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Young. Very nice talk. So are there questions or comments? Here from locals. There's one in the chat, so um, so someone is asking about uh, reheating. So sorry, preheating. So you preheating. mentioned it at the very beginning, but could you maybe elaborate a bit more on the effect of preheating in this case? Uh, yeah. So yeah, for example, uh, like uh, for example, we look at the preheating produce the uh, bosonic particle phi will be well in by default will be the Higgs. So here due to the uh, trilinear coupling, there will be a taconic uh, re resonance, which tend to make preheating very efficient. But once you produce a lot of Higgs, this will give rise to some uh, back reaction due to the Higgs self-coupling here. So this back reaction will, uh, will counter-react on the taconic mass make preheating less efficient. And for 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 many channel due to the poly blocking and you momentum space you cannot uh, have a number density larger than one due to the poly blocking. So this is uh, the two 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 thing, uh, two fact that why I mentioned preheating in you know, our setup is not efficient. Uh, but in general, it can be the preheating can be very very efficient if you, if you don't have this uh, uh, self coupling or back reaction. Yeah. I okay, hope I answered the question. Yeah. Further questions or comments? In the YouTube chat, maybe? Locals? I have a question. So at the very end, you present plot for, for scalars and, uh, and, and fermions, so the, your very last plot, but not um, for vectors. Do you have an intuition what could happen in that case? Well, I mean, 
for example, because I mentioned before, for a vector, you have uh, more degree freedom. The, for example, if I use the same parameter, those, uh, the, the gravitational wave in the vector case will be larger compared to the other two cases. It is similar to the n equal two case, simply because for a vector, we have more degree freedom. Yeah, but in terms of the boost, do you think will be more like the fermion, like a small boost or like a scalar with a larger boost? Well, the, the for a fermion, sorry, for a vector is also a, I would expect it's similar to the bosonic case because effectively, I mean, the vector is also bosonic particle, right? So there will be also a separation for rate. So I expect uh, the, the signal in the vector case can also be boosted. But we don't observe this uh, uh, boost because the rate decreed in the fermionic case is proportional to uh, M5, not inverse proportional. So if something, if you have a model uh, where the decay rate is inverse proportional mass, if you can suppress a mass, or if you can uh, make the mass larger, you can suppress the, the decay and further suppress the entropy relation, you, you can enhance the signal. So I, I I expect in the vector channel you can also have a boost. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I I have a, yeah. a question. So so in principle you have shown that um, different potentials for the for the inflaton give different. Uh, Gravitational wave signals. Mm -hmm. So, so does this leave any imprint on any other cosmo on any cosmological um, a parameter? Something that we could that we could observe. Um, very, very good question. So, for example, uh, like uh, the, the, as I mentioned before, this kind of setup are motivated in some alpha track model. For example, indeed, uh, if you uh, if you consider, for example, the n, we, we have considered n equal to one or two, uh, or n equal to four or, 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 or n equal to two or four. So if you consider different n, uh, the inflationary parameter is all, can also be changed. So this is one, uh, the other change for the cosmological observation. So, but for a parameter we have chosen, it is satisfied the inflationary constraint which is assumed by the current Planck plus bicep data. And, and, and if, are there any, if, if, do we expect to measure this, to, to improve these constraints or maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, I think maybe the, exclude some in? You say, uh, actually here the N, uh, actually I forgot to change it. The two N correspond to our N. Which means that n equal to one here will correspond to n equal to two, in, and n equal to four will will correspond to n equal to here. You say, I mean, uh, this is this is a current kind of bound. This is a the, the blue the blue region is a current kind of hmm. bound for a tensor to scalar ratio. If in the future this bound can move lower, in principle, this can also help to constrain the parameter we have chosen. Mm -hmm. But I think the future, so here the counter bound for tensor to scalar ratio is around the 10 to still around 0.035. In the future, it will be like a uh, CMB stage four. It will be around 10 to minus three, but still uh, it's far from some of the prompt space. Okay. Okay, thank you. Maybe a last question for Young. Okay, maybe I I, I have a small maybe question or, or comment. So uh, I was just thinking that um, we know there are many sources of high frequency gravitational wave, right? For example, they can come from, uh, for example, they can come from the evaporation of primordial black holes, right? The gravitons mm -hmm. coming from the primordial black holes, they can also constitute a, a gravitational wave, which has a high frequency. So I'm just thinking that 
if there is a detection of a high frequency gravitational wave in in future experiments so mm -hmm. can we disentangle that the sources okay, how where, like yeah how yeah to, how do we distinguish ah uh, yeah yes yes can we really have a handle on that that if it is coming from brain strung or if it is coming from like the primordial black hole evaporation can we distinguish them perhaps not i'm not sure if remember if i remember correctly uh you say for our brain strung the spectrum uh is very broad if i yeah. remember correctly for the uh, uh, gravitation wave from the primordial black hole evaporation the spectrum is a uh, lighter So I think in general this is a very good question. How do in the future if we see some signal, how do we distinguish uh, the source of signal? I think one possibility is where the shape. If you if you if the shape of the spectrum is very very well studied, we can uh, in principle dis uh, disentangle the different sources. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. But it's difficult to detect these guys, right? Yeah, it's also very difficult. For example, this uh, detector is proposed, and uh, in, in reality, it's not existed yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any further questions. So we'd like to thank you, Young, again for this super nice talk. Thanks. And yeah, so we'll have another webinar in a couple of weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's beginning of um, of June. So so let's reconvene a couple of weeks here again, the same time, same day. So thank you very much, guys, and um, thanks again, Young. Thanks. See you. Thanks for your invitation. Yeah.